Yes, good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to you all. My name is Juri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali, and I will try to uh, conduct this conversation. We are very, very honored um, to have Marina Abramovic and Joel Gamzu here with us today. Also, hello to the watchers at home. Um, this is the third Hugo van Berkel artist talk, and the first one uh, was with Ivo van Hoven, and the second one with Milo Rao, and both of them were together with Joel Gamzu. Um, and these talks circle around the question, what does it mean to be on stage and to engage with an audience? So it's very nice that you're here. Um, Johan, Johan and I have been holding these series of conversations because we are exploring what it means to perform art on a stage. And what are we doing if we perform on stage? And what is it what happens between the artist and the public? What does it mean when we human beings like to perform in front of an audience and that that audience wants to be present, actually? So uh, these sort of questions, uh, questions which goes actually to the heart of the artistic practice of the Bali and of Joel Gamzu and of Marina Abramovic. Whom better to ask these questions than Marina Abramovic? Uh, I would say, um, the greatest performance artist of our time, um, who has changed, for many of us at least, the way we... You're supposed to say this only after I die. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that, that's actually an interesting... We, we, um, there are so many death threats nowadays that... <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, that's maybe... I died already four times this week, it's okay. At, at least, at least, at, um, because you both... Um, um, worked together uh, for the past weeks and years, actually, uh, in performing the seven deaths of Maria Callas. Actually, there were eight, I think, eight deaths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so you died many, many times uh, these weeks. Um, in Carré, I, I, I presume a lot of you have seen uh, the opera in Carré. Who has seen it, actually? And that's quite, quite a few people. And who has, who has gone to a no intermission in Carré as well? Yeah, that's interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, quite, a, quite a lot of people. Um, um, we have been um, conducting these talks. Um, let me say just a little bit about Joel Gamzu. Um, uh, you are director of uh, the Theatre in Bremen still. You're uh, leaving. Not anymore. Oh, you Already just done. left. Yeah. A few months ago. Yeah. And um, you are a conductor. Um, I might say one of the most gifted conductors of his age, <laughs> although I might only be able to say that after you die. Um, and uh, I don't have any problem with that, so you can say it now that I already did. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy with that. Um, um, conducting all over Europe in the main opera houses and theater, um, music theaters in Europe. For also famous for finishing the unfinished Mahler Symphony No. 10 when you were very young. Um, okay. Um, we have many um, uh, fragments of uh, your work, and um, um, first of all, I would like to look at one of the fragments of the um, Seven Deaths of Maria Callas we have here. Let's have a look as an, as an introduction and then um, start our talk.
one of the many deaths. <laughs> Um, we could ask so many things about already this scene, but um, um, is playing Maria Callas different than performing as yourself, playing her? Wow. Let's start. First question would be why I'm doing this all? Why <laughs> performance artists start doing opera? I don't think it was an opera, but. Uh, close to an opera. Yeah, yeah. close to an yeah, opera. Yeah. And if you tell me 10 years ago <laughs> that I will do opera, I think you're crazy. I will never touch this this really, you know, quite uh, ancient form of art because opera is very different than performance. But I think that after 50 years of career, I'm so secure in performance that I think why not try something new and different? Mm -hmm. And why do try the opera that in a way I can connect with very young audience, which is not really anymore the audience will normally go to opera, yes. which I really actually succeeded. And I wanted to do something fresh and different and work with the video, work with the different forms, you know, have the composer to compose different parts, have very young conductor to, to work with the, with the orchestra. So just kind of make another interesting mix. And, uh, you know, first of all, there are two things here. The one that I, I perform for every dad here in video, and then I also play the eight deaths, which is actually on the stage, yeah. playing Carlos in her last, uh, in the bedroom where she died. And, uh, but that play Carlos in the bedroom she died is very much mixed with my own story because the, the photographs which I'm looking and they are not photographs of Carlos and Nazis and Zaffarelli and Pasolini and the, the, the people she worked with. They're my own life, my own photographs, my own wedding, my own, you know, relationships, my own, you know, compli complicated relationship with the mother and everything else. So I kind of mix up the, her story, my story in one. So that was easy for me to connect. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, for the film, you know, this it's not easy for performance artist to do something like that. I mean, just this uh, scene that you saw here, you know, I have to, this is, uh, of course, green screen, and we, we film in Hollywood, but to do this, I have to jump 17 mm -hmm. times. It's not like one time. I, 17 times in my age is not easy at all, because I actually have to reach the floor. I have to, you know, have that impact on the car. And also to be relaxed and to look like I'm floating. So this was a lots of things that I have to learn on the way that I didn't know. And then also Willem Dafoe, he helped me very much to actually explain to me how you can be in the character and, and the play this character without actually thinking that acting is wrong, that I always thinking acting was wrong. Yeah. I think the theater is fake, you know, the public, you know, sitting in the dark, this, the, the, somebody's playing somebody else, you have to repeat, you have to rehearse, everything what performance is not. But you don't really play someone else. Huh? Not, I don't think this at all. No, no, I don't think anyone does, you, because you always do and you don't at the same time, because no one, no one, you always bring yourself to a character, even in theater. Yeah, but this, this I really kind of, you know, have to get into that. And I, I think I did it. I, in, in, every t in every of this scene, I was kind of physically and mentally feeling that I'm dying. And then we only made the seven deaths of seven characters of different theaters, operas. So we have Tosca, Treviata, Madame Butterfly, Lucia Lamamour, Carmen, and all them. And then I have a feeling that something was missing. And this was missing the death of herself, the callous herself. And this was the one that I actually play her spirit more than anything else. And this is the only time that you really heard her, her voice in real. And the rest was on singers. But all these roles, callous play herself. And the idea was that actually in her mind, she'd been killed by the same man over and again. And this is Onazis, who actually broke her spirit. And she died for actually broken heart. And I felt this was the kind of interesting to, to actually only put the deaths. Nobody ever actually got this idea just to play deaths. That's it. End of the opera. I always, I always make fun that each opera is three, four, five hours, but the deaths are shorter. So this one is only one hour and 32 minutes. Not so bad. <laughs> not boring. And, and a lot of death. And so you get, you get a lot of death for your money, actually. Yeah. And in operas, you have to wait you for get, hours. You get the entire perspective of opera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. And um, 
and and only one time it's a recording of Maria Callas, and the rest is sung, you know, by beautiful beautiful singers. Um, uh, but um, you said, you know, um, Willem Dafoe reconciled you in a way with acting, and you said also, I think, in no uh, in no intermission, that the theater for you was sort of the enemy, because uh, in the theater blood was fake, and in performance blood was blood, yeah. and which was theater is ketchup, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, but it, did it reconcile you? This this this. So, so now you know how to act. Did it did it reconcile you with the theater as f make believe or no no? Fake, I, I, maybe? I, I definitely think that the theater have its own magic and is so important. And as as, as a dance, as a theater, as opera, and uh, to me, it's so interesting to kind of cross these borders because right now, you know. I've done so much of the stuff of pushing really mental, physical limits already. So I'm interested to explore different aspects. But to me, it's also this work will never be possible without incredible collaboration with the great people working with this, in this piece. I mean, the, the, we have Nikodijevic who created Marko Nikodijevic music. We have Marko Brambila who created all the the, 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 the computer uh, the generated clouds. We have the Petr Skalman who made the text. We have really this and then we have Yoel who put all this together because you know for Yoel it's not easy this work at all because every time he have to deal with the different singers and you have to deal with the different orchestra and every begin every time every opera wherever we play around the world he starts with zero so I want to ask Yoel how that works for you because it's not that you have orchestra who's touring around and know every note everything is a beginning each time yeah but i want to start from another beginning actually of where we started when we first met about this piece and i think that when i was first approached to to meet marina and to do this piece the thing that hooked me i didn't know much about marina but i've loved colors my entire life and that's what connected us right away because marina how many years have you been into colors when I was 14, start. So let's just say a while. And, uh, and for me, it's, I was even less than 14. Um, and for me, she symbolized actually the, I would say the only interpreter I know who, as Marina says often, who literally died every time she went on stage. And you could say there was no, there was no catch up. I think that this woman somehow, a part of her died every time she went on stage, every show. And that's, I mean, you can only do that that many times, and that's why at some point in a very early age, when you give not 100%, but when you really give 150%, at some point the battery is, is gone, you know? She died of a broken heart, she died of a, also of the end of resource. Solitude, loneliness. Yes, exactly. And because she was the person who was on stage, there was no Kalas off stage, in a sense, you know? And I think that, that uh, the mixture of this absolute, it's not even commitment, but it is absolution in every way because there was no compromise is what inspires me so much. And I don't know any instrumentalist or singer or hardly anyone who had who really went all the way in that kind of way. And at the same time, she was incredibly strong and incredibly fragile at the same time because if you're not vulnerable, no one will relate to you as, a, as, a, as an audience. You, know, you only relate to people that let you see them also in their weakness and in their vulnerability. And I think that's what you both have in common in a way. And I think that's how we, we, started, we started through a love for Kalas and also are in a way a, a common commitment to go that path that means you will make yourself vulnerable, which means you will not only show yourself in your pretty side, it will not only, you will always risk and you will risk failing. And I think showing failure on stage is, a, is the most brave act you can do. It can of course become very, very vain, but in a sense, the daring to, to risk failure mm -hmm. is, brings you to the state of mind in which you can actually move people. I just want to add something. For me, it was very interesting to study Carlos. There's very few recordings of Carlos on the stage and some recordings of her interviews. But it was very interesting to see, actually to study, when she stopped singing, how, the way how she actually greeted the public. The transformation of that moment when she actually stepped out of role into her own self. She's this kind of fragile little bird. Her shoulders became small. She's all kind of bending. And it was incredible to see vulnerability the moment of getting this incredible charismatic the, the figure on the stage and re receiving the applause like a kind of divine shower. From the and you see, that's why theater is not fake. Yeah. Because both of, these, the, the, both of these people are real. She is both of those people in one person. 
But only the, the agreement that we all sit in a thousand people in a hall and we agree that we know that what is happening is fake makes it possible for her to get into the state of mind. The, uh, totally right. And then also the another thing that she's always resonated in my, in my head, the Carlos said, so important thing. She said, when I'm on the stage, I make sure that one part of my brain is in con complete control and other part of the brain frees, free and loose. And only if I can combine these two parts of the brain, the performance is, is great. And that's she done, the balance of this fragility and the control. Yeah. Both being... Wait, but you didn't answer the question. No, you see. But the question was about starting... It a new always, question. No, the, my question was, <laughs> how was it starting every time we set up this opera in Paris, in Berlin, in Athens, all these places that you have to start all from the beginning? Yeah. Well, it was, it was different in every city in a sense that the parameters were completely different. How much time we had, how the orchestra was. Some orchestras are more open-minded, some less open-minded. Some singers we could pick ourselves, some singers not. In a way, the, the, the challenge is always, because we, we've been working on this for, I don't know, it's now five years, and for us it's so clear what we want from this piece, and you come to a group of people that are seeing the piece for the first time, and you have a week to, in a way, to rehearse something that to you is already very clear. And the challenge is, in a way, it's the same thing. The challenge is to have your preconceived skeleton of what you want it to become, and yet at the same time accept that in every city, it will be slightly different because you have people that are not a machine, they're musicians that will bring their own voice into that skeleton that is preconceived. And juggling this sort of, this big ship that kind of sails in the direction you know you wanted to sail, but you know that it, the little paths will always be different. And every orchestra breathes differently, every culture is different. I mean, between our last one in Naples and here in Amsterdam, it was the biggest contrast of the entire tour. You forget Athens. No, I, I, let's forget Athens. <laughs> <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> no, this, um, we will not elaborate on that. Athens is a wonderful city with incredible culture, and we had a great time there for many, many reasons. Okay, anybody Greek in this audience? Anybody Greek? <laughs> Two, one Greek. Maria no, Maria Callas, but it was not easy, the Greece, just to tell you, the Greek person. Plus, Maria Callas was actually born in, in Queens in New York City. But okay, let's, let's, let's call her Greek for now. So, so what was not easy about it? Then we all want to know. I mean, and now, yeah. <laughs> but now we make it sound a lot more interesting than it actually was. Yeah, but was. now we all want to know. <laughs> Marina, do you want to start? Okay, but I mean, no, no offense to anybody, but I, I tell you my story. Okay, the Greece. So... <laughs> no. <laughs> do we really want to do this? We just, <laughs> we just, we just finished opera uh, to perform in Opera Garnier, which is an incredible, mesmerizing performance because we was the first opening opera after the COVID ever in Paris. So, in Paris, so and you know the Garnier opera with Chagall, with how the look environment is, was just an incredible experience. And I have personally something that never happened in any opera before. First of all. The Maria Callas lose her voice on the same stage in this Opera Garnier. Then she died also in Paris. We actually, re, re, um, how you call it, we re reconstruct entire bedroom of Maria Callas from the photographs and, and the material as it was in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris where she died. So I'm lying on this bed. And honestly, I, I mean, it's, it's spooky to say, but I felt a strange cold wind go around my, my head and just very slightly somebody touched my face. To me, it was spirit for sure of Maria Callas right there on stage. Nowhere else appeared except in Paris. So we are in Paris and it was, it was really incredible for me emotionally to play there. And it was very strong. And there, you know, we had uh, the same orchestra from Vienna, no, the, the, not the orchestra, but the singers very similar that we have in Munich already. So we was used to the cast, used to the people and everything. And now we are going to Greece. So just by, by chance, I looked at the, the internet and the newspaper, and I saw the Greece have already announced our, our, our uh, program with the names of singers that I never heard in my life. I say, who are these people? And I'm the director, and I should really know who these people are. So I, I completely panic. I call the, the me. The, I call. <laughs> 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 oh my god! I call. I we, we call the theater, and they say, 
Oh no, but they're the Greek singers. We can't employ anybody but Greece. This is a law, which nobody ever told me. Fine. Which never was ever true, but that's another matter. Okay, this I don't know. But they say only Greek singers can sing. So I say, oh my God. So I had two possibilities in my life. If I was young, and at that time I was not, so I could say, you know, ego high to the ceiling and say, no, fuck this, I don't want, I, you know, I, I didn't been asked, I'm going to cancel the opera, and I'm going to Greece, this is it. And then, you know, thinking more like from wisdom, like now, Abramovich, <laughs> thinking, what, when the old Greeks going to be against me? They will say, you don't want to come to the Greece, you don't like a Greek singer, you don't like Carlos, this is so bad for me. I, I spent all these years making this piece. So I go for the really safe solution. You forgot one little detail that I was calling you crying every day, but while we were rehearsing, telling you it's horrible, it's horrible, and you were trying to calm me down. No, this is true. He, he, he was completely in total panic. So then, then I had the press conference, and I say to the press, I chose only Greek singers. <laughs> This is the only way out to, to actually find out. But now, we still don't know how these people look like. We don't know how they sing. So we asked them to, to send us the internet, you know, to send us information. So we all got you know, pictures, but no anybody how to sing. And the, the curriculum is amazing. Covent Garden, Metropolitan, all these places, like the, the tops of the tops. Wow. Then we come to rehearse. UL is all up to you now. Rehearsal. Re oh, I have to do the dirty part now. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. So my first rehearsal with the orchestra that started almost an hour late uh, was in, 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 quite interesting in the sense that it never happened to me that three different people in the orchestra started actually having a fist fight with one another during the rehearsal. So the principal second violins was beating the cellist. The bassoonist was shouting at the clarinetist. Everyone was talking the entire time. I, for me, it was a little bit like visiting the zoo. I really didn't know what was going on. They were all talking Greek. And I, after 15 minutes, and I thought, maybe I've become too German after all these years in Germany that I actually expect people to, like, for a rehearsal to actually be re rehearsal. You have to be at least five minutes early to be on time. Well, exactly. And punctuality has never been my strength. But I mean, and waiting for an hour for then people to shout at each other was quite interesting. And then... Orchestra rehearsal, we survived. I just asked the very uh, kindly the organizer if it's usually like that here. And he said, what do you mean? That was such a disciplined rehearsal. <laughs> I was like, well, I take that as a compliment. And then we had our first rehearsal with the singers the next day. And the piece is written for 12 singers in the choir and seven soloists. So um, when the, before the choir arrived, I said to the choir master, well, where are the 12 singers of the choir? He said, we have 50 said, but we don't need 50, we need 12. He said, no, no, you need 50. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's, we need 12. And, it's like, and he's like, you don't understand. You need 50, trust me. So I, then I understood. And um, when we're actually now, in our first rehearsal with the singers, it was quite strange because Marina would, came in, she's like, she's like, baby, is this really the real singers? <laughs> it was you. And it's like, you mean it's really the singers singing? Like, these are the ones that are going to be on stage? You were in shock. I know. I asked him, I asked him outside to ask him, you know, what's going on. And he said, that's what you got. And but it's, it's very interesting because all these people that we, I mean, it's really kind of nasty to say all these, tell all these stories, but like, they all, it, it said in their biographies that they were singing in the greatest house in the world and they came in and you were asking yourself in what kind of... Uh, but honestly, the, one thing which is wonderful with the Greece, Greek love Greek people. Every singer got standing ovations. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely. So, in a way, Marina, listen, we fulfilled our purpose because the audience had a great time. They had a great time. I mean, you, you brought had a in nervous a nervous breakdown. I think all the families of all the singers were in the hall. <laughs> no, it's true. And you, you was really a nervous breakdown situation. Me? Yeah. Yes. He was ter terrible. But Let's talk about something else. Okay, fine. Um, we just saw that fragment uh, where you were falling down and falling down and falling down. Um, uh, that was in the studio, of course, but it, um, it was partly a reference, I might say, to the film Titanic at the front. And there was this beautiful picture. You, you're approaching this, the, the, the roof of a limousine. I think we have the picture up here. Let's see. What do we, yeah, this, this picture. Where you, you know that picture? 
this is absolutely my reference. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a picture actually of the woman who fall from the realist from the the the, the Empire State, State Building. building. Yeah. She actually just after engagement, she actually commits suicide, and they call this picture as the most beautiful dead ever. Because basically, she fall on the car and look and look like that she's sleeping, but the moment they want to pick her up, she was in pieces. But that was look like she's sleeping. You can see her stocking roll down. So uh, this is my uh, actually one of the references when I wanted to do this, uh, the Tosca, because in Tosca, you know, she she went from the castle in 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 different times, you know, and I know 18th century, 17th century, whatever. And I think wanted to put in modern time, so I exchanged that, you know, into the into New York and exchange into the car. Yeah. It's all imaginary and create that image. How you knew this? Because I watched it carefully, and I saw you approaching the roof yeah. of the of this limousine, the black limousine. I know that picture; it's an amazing picture. Good eyes. And um, uh, <laughs> and I thought, you know, it must be the reference of it, and They're it's the most the beautiful death. That's how it's called. Absolutely, direct yeah. reference. Yeah, yeah the, the the woman is called Evelyn. She's called, and she's uh, she died just when she was 24 years old. Um, it was suicide. Yeah. Was suicide? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Days, <laughs> and um, so um, there's many re sort of these references in it. I mean, if you really look for them, yeah, the Othello snakes who yeah. always appear in my performances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, uh, uh, is that sort of a way for you to um, to compose your word of art to sort of put things in it you know or you like or you. You know, you but this really the idea of the, of the of this piece was really to to have some things that I have in performance already and to appear again in this yeah. context. You know, yeah. like Otello, it mostly is strangulation. He he just killed her with his hands, and I I actually have uh, four pythons in the snakes around my neck. Uh, do you have this image here? No, you don't. I don't think so. No, no we don't. Uh, we didn't want to use the whole movie because it's wonderful. No, <laughs> but <true>. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you might want to use so it. So the snakes rather. are yeah. actually killing me, not not uh, Otello himself. Yeah, there's there's huge snakes around your neck, and they're real. Um, you have no qualms about having these. These these are strong snakes. You know, when I done the first performance of the, with one of the snakes, actually the public have to come, and I have the person who was responsible for the snakes, and he told me something very important. If snake is tied around your neck, you absolutely have to not to fear, and your pulse should be very calm, because if the snake fear the pulse, she's just tightening around your neck. No pressure. No <laughs> And what happened, you know, what in, not in this piece, but in another piece, in the, the, one of the first performances I made with Snake, Snake actually slipped from my head and started going around my neck. And I was panicking. And he had no absolutely force. It's such a huge muscle to take it off. So he was telling to me, breathe, breathe, breathe. And, and I had to calm myself. And then the snake just kind of whined out like a tree, like I was around a tree. It's very difficult to relax in a panic. I think most people know that in the audience. It's very the next thing to say is just don't try it at home. <laughs> I mean, don't try what I do. <laughs> So, um, wow. <laughs> so, so you actually put yourself in a situation where you, uh, where it's very, very dangerous to panic. Yeah, but you know, it's it's very important to have some courage as a performance artist. Yeah. I, I came from the parents, both national heroes. You know, I have to kind of prove myself. Because they were under resistance against the Nazis as nat national. Absolutely yeah. yes. <laughs> So you had to prove, this is all about proving it to your parents? No, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a <laughs> funny story. When I, I, I decided with Ulai to walk Great Wall of China, um, mm -hmm. I, very important for me was to call my father. Because my father, in the Second World War, there was in every book of history at that time in, in my country, <clears throat> they was talking about Igmanski March, this march through the mountain Igman. 
Mm -hmm. And that march was so difficult, and par the, the Germans was following them, and there was these partisans, they have to go through this huge mountain in the middle of winter of minus 25 with hardly any clothes, with the naked feet, we got no shoes anymore, through the frozen water, and there's so many people died on that side. My father was one of the maybe few hundred people who survived that march and came from the other side. So when I was going to the Chinese wall, I would say, I call him and I say, I'm going to walk the Chinese wall. And she, he said, but how long is this Chinese wall? I said, 2,500 kilometer, my part, 2,500 kilometer, all I part. And he said, but how long is it going to take? And I say, I think around three months. And, and then I say, you done Ingmarski March, I can do this. And he looked at me and he said, you know how long was my walk? And I have no idea because this was history, this was legend. He said, one night. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was impressed. <laughs> well, actually, we, have, we do have uh, 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 a picture of the Great Wall. Actually, I think it's number four for the guys upstairs. Um, the Lovers, the Great Wall. And we have a few slides of them. Let's see whether we can... We can no, we have a video fragment. You're right. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> Looks like a picture to me, but... It's it's not moving. Oh, oh no, this is just what. Yeah. It is. It is. It you is. know, the wall is mostly completely broken, on, and only around Beijing and some cities are reparated. Otherwise, you should climb, and you go through the mountains up and down. And I remember when I finished this, uh, one of my friends says, so, "You know, who I meet to separate, say goodbye." One American friend said to me, why didn't you just, why didn't you just make a phone call? <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're walking there, you're walking to, towards each other, you and Ulai, and um, um, I was wondering, because you said, uh, this is a quote from Marina Abraham, which contact with the public is absolutely essential, because if a performance doesn't have the public, the performance is non-existent. Because, it's, it, because if the uh, public is not there, if it doesn't have the pub, the performance is non-existent. That, in that time, but it was not me, Ulla no, said that. No, that's what you, you said later on in an interview. I was thinking about, about what a performance is. There needs to be an audience. And I was thinking, is, this, is there an audience here? Is it the performance? No, the audience was just, you know, not there. And this was so different than anything else that Ula and me done because in the non-existent performance, we, we just actually, it was even at that time was no social media, mm -hmm. but you know, people knew that we are walking this wall. So after we finished it, it was very important to me, in my case, to create something I call transitory objects. It was a sculptures that I actually kind of can make public see what I went through and have the, you know, and all I made his own work, I made my own work, mm -hmm. that we can include public in experience. But because the, the public was not there. Where the work becomes a performance, is it the moment that you are doing it or is it the moment that someone else is perceiving it? No, to me it's important presence of public. No, but in that case. But there was no public. So exactly. to me it was, you know, we can call this action. You know, two of us actually walk towards each other, walking to say goodbye. And that looks like, like such a romantic love story. But actually, uh, we have now film, which become the work. But performance public was not there. And I think for me, is, is there's so many artists who can actually do performance in their own studio and then film it and then present as a video mm -hmm. to the public. But to me, presence of public is everything. Well, exactly. That's what I mean. Because exactly. the, the, the documentation of a piece, and the same we have the same in music. I mean, I I'm personally, I. I resent CDs in so many ways. I think that a documentation of a piece of music is never the piece of music. 
And so even you know, people that have gone to a specific concert and then years later they listen to a recording of that concert, they're usually terribly disappointed because they had this experience and the experience had to do with how it sounded in the hall, how the, the, the person that was next to them, how they slept at night, their mood the day they came in, the magic of the co collective experience with other people. And then 30 years later they listen to a CD of exactly that performance and they go, well, it was all right but it doesn't have that magical uh, effect, of course. And that's something you can never reconstruct. I totally agree with you. To me, w this is why performance is such a time-based art. You have to be there to experience. And this is also a material form of art because when you bring home you c the experience, you can't hang experience on the wall like a painting. You really have to have, the only what is left with you is memory and you can narrate the experience to somebody else. But actually, it's all But that's almost emotions. like a new, a new work then. The narration. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's in your work. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, the like Aboriginal culture is exactly based on, on yeah, that's nar narrative culture. Yes. Yeah. You say that in, in your book as well. That so but 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 wait one moment. So you're saying that if the recording is not so listening to a to a CD in your car or whatever in your room and is not art. It it is a documentation of a one attempt of performing a piece. Yeah. But I mean, again, that we have to start with, is the score of a piece of music art? Yeah. I think the score of a piece of music is a, a collection of signs, of symbols, that are an invitation to, a, to go on a journey. There will be different every single time by a different interpreter, even the same interpreter doing it. There is no Beethoven Fifth Symphony. There is a draft or an attempt or an experiment at Beethoven Fifth Symphony that is happening every single moment. And it's actually the same, like you say, the moment that, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but of course the moment sound happens, it's already gone. So there is no a piece of music that is ever, ever finished. And so do I think the documentation of a performance is the piece of art? Absolutely not. Yeah. I think it's a, it has value to document it for, for historical reasons, but I mean, I, ne I would never consider a CD that I make, that's why I don't make them, uh, uh, in any way, not only comparable to the live experience, I, also don't, I think it's a completely different procedure. It's a, and, and so, and it's funny, I had an experience recently actually, um, I was, I, th I think I told you that last week, I, was, I just did a, a Carmen in Hamburg, yeah. The Carmen. And yeah. apparently a lot of people got very angry about the way I did it, which I still don't really know why, but uh, it seemed to shock a lot of people, although I never meant to shock anyone. It was just one reading of a piece. And I got so insecure after the dress rehearsal because everyone, there were people coming to me telling me it's the greatest thing they've ever heard, and there were people telling me it's the worst crime against music they've ever heard. And it was just these two extremes, and I thought, okay, well, something must have really upset people. So I s uh, there was a recording of that rehearsal. So I sent the recording of the first minute to a friend of mine and I said, what do you think? I mean, is this re like, can I bring this out? Like, is it okay? And he's like, and he wrote me back. He said, listen, we have to talk. It's really kind of terrible. I was like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, yeah, you see, I mean, the tempo here and this there, well, it doesn't really work and this problem and that problem. And I was like, oh my God, I have, I'm opening in two days and my dress, I mean, it was apparently, the dress rehearsal was apparently dreadful. I didn't know what to do and I could only do it that way. And I mean, I did it in a way, in a similar way in the premiere, because I can only do it the way that I believe in it. Same friend was there and he came to me and said, it was incredible. I mean, I've never heard it more convincing. I was like, wait, but I just did the same thing. And he's like, yes, but it doesn't work at all. When you listen with your, sit with your headphones at home and you hear a dry, it's like, you know, when you take a flower and you put it in a book and you have a dry flower, that's not a flower. A flower, if, you don't, if it doesn't smell, it's not a flower. And so then, then I can argue the entire history of performance art would not exist if we'd have some kind of recordings, even in the shitty gray photographs or bad video installations in, in those days because camera was not great. But still, we have some. But it's, an, like, it's like an archive. Relate on. But it's an archive, it's not the piece. Yeah, but this always been, you know, archive and always been documentation. It's very clear. Nobody claimed that. But there is also the work that you can perform in the front of the video and become video artwork. Or but you, but you can perform thing. in the front of photograph and there is a photographic artwork. But if you perform in the front of audience, then documentation is documentation. Well, that's the point. But that's exactly the thing because when you perform in front of a camera for the, as a video art, then the, the result is the work, not what was happening when you were filming it. But you know, to me, it's so the old story of documentation and real and 
not is not real is such a big deal in, you know in and and very lots of lots of thoughts i have about it like to me with artists is present i paid so much attention to actually record this piece real time nobody ever going to look this 716 hours and 30 minutes but for me it was important that i have real time recording for well, every single person sitting and from the my point of view the point of view of the public and then the frontal view and as this recording exists but again you know it's is documentation of the piece who i will never repeat in my life and nobody going to look 716 hours but, but the, the fact that is real time is important exactly but the, so it's a documentation of the piece of art which was when you had were there when you were present when yeah. the artist was present when the public was present yeah. so the so could could i say that the canvas on which you paint is time is that sort of the medium you put your art on because it's on time it's in time yeah in, in this in the yes actually yeah. yeah yeah but a different yeah. question um would your state of mind be different in the moment of performing the piece knowing that it's being documented or if it wasn't being documented no change at all. I was totally in the piece. I, I don't. I mean, this was just for me the prop set up, but my piece will never change. So it knowing that it's being documented does not change at all the way you. you First of all, when we start performance in early seventies, there was a big group of artists which was actually thinking that we should never record anything. That is only life experience, and is going to die with life experience, and that's it. And then we change our mind because we will not have history if we didn't. So, you know, we have to always think in our life to have healthy compromise. <laughs> we, Which I call healthy compromise. And because also you have to sell something because you, I mean, if, if it's only time based and if it's gone and there's only memory, yeah. you have to, you live as an artist, of course. You have to. S this is why I'm always talking about pyramid of, of art. Yeah. Music the top be it mostly material after performance and then everything else <laughs> come on you should be happy with this <laughs> would you agree I, I'm not I don't really believe in hierarchy in this context but I think there is definitely a um, there is of course the biggest tr uh, let's say tragedy of a performing artist it doesn't matter if you're a dancer or an actor or whatever is that you don't have um, as a composer let's put it this way you don't have control over what your audience will see as a painter you present a painting and of course 50 percent of the process in the moment when the, your viewer is consuming the painting is happening in their head but still the artwork that you present you have 100 percent control over what is to be seen and as a composer you write a piece and i mean to be honest writing a full score of a symphony is gives you so little control over the result as a composer even in a painting you don't have control when you see it yeah. it's moving all the time nobody will hear you i'm sorry but we have to bring later on we'll bring a microphone because otherwise people okay, are i just want to say something it's so interesting you know technology we are talking in 70s i mean we start with video and it was always horribly gray and bad quality and you know we never have money with little super eight sometimes you know to photograph or, or, or to film things so documentation was really bad bad quality then the tape was one hour then we all tried to make performances was exactly one hour that we don't have this break of changing the tape so this was all condition in the 70s then came now 90s and 80s and, and so you can see the most incredibly important the really historical pieces of art, very badly recorded, and you can see really shitty pieces of art on the absolutely high tech, you know, with such incredible glamorous big cameras, and it's very deceiving, you know. But you know that actually, things. but the recording because it's too good quality now. Every, that's every, exactly the same thing in music. music. Every internet and any kind of you know, but you know, image the, of the CD, the ability to produce a CD destroyed classical music. Because, you know, I mean, in the 1950s, when you wanted to record a symphony, you had an orchestra, you had a microphone, you played a piece, and if you were lucky, you did two takes, and then you put that, and you, that was it. Nowadays, I mean, every violinist, you know, you don't even need to play the violin very well, you just play one note, and then they're going to glue that to the next note, and then they're going to glue that to the next note, and that's how you produce, and that's what a lot of people have in their mind. They get these CDs of these perfect performances that everything is perfect, all the notes are perfect, of course it's boring as hell, and then they go to the concert and they think, well, what I'm going to experience should sound like my CD. So all these young violinists, they work like, they don't take any risk in their playing whatsoever because they think they have to sound perfect like the CD. That's why 
music is becoming more and more boring for the past 30 years. The better the CD, the more boring the players. You know what I like about you, Yoel? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a dangerous beginning. I'm curious. I'm sure there's a little bit of a, a twist. Yeah, there's a twist. I like so much about Yoel that he's so passionate, that he has so much fire in himself. And then he he really live for every note of music. I mean, you hear things that nobody hear. You have this incredible precise ear that is very, really, really special, and you are never satisfied. You need perfection. But? What is but? Oh, I thought there was a but. I don't have but. <laughs> <laughs> but no, back to, to, thank you, but back to what we're, no, but you see what I mean with the CD? You, you're always so pessimistic. <laughs> no, there's no but. You I want to change the subject? No, listen, but you know what I mean with the perfection of the technology. I do, I do. And, yeah. and, you perfe and you're, you're no, never satisfied. But perfection, perfection is a kind of utopia for you. For me, utopia in a performance is every single person on that stage being 100% vulnerable and risking also making a fool of themselves by giving everything they have and risking also going beyond their boundaries. Sounds that is, that is for me utopia. Um, the perfection of... I mean, I don't think anyone ever wanted to pay money to hear a violinist or a singer singing lots of notes in tune one after the other. I mean, I don't know what, I would never pay money for that. And that's nowadays all you get, or mostly what you get. You see all these people and you go, and it's, this very, it's a very clean performance of something. That's not perfection. And so what you mean, and I think you see that in rehearsals when we work together, and that is a big fight because with a lot of orchestras, you have people that have had a job for 30 years, they're very comfortable, they have a house and a car and a salary, and they, you know, and they think about their holidays and whatever, and they come and they sit like that, and they sort of they, they tell, oh, what this, can this young guy tell me that I haven't heard before? And then after 10 minutes, where they look, you know, it's like, okay, let's go on. Know, and they think they know everything better, of course. And it's always the, the challenge as a young person, you have to prove yourself. But another matter, most orchestra players do their job as a routine. And for me, I mean, routine is death, you know? And so you go in front of these people and you say, you would want to wake them up and like, listen, there is no, there is no, you do the same thing you've done. Because they say, oh, we've played this for 30 years like that. Why can't we do it the same way? We've always done it. And that is, I mean, you just hearing that, you won't, so the perfection I'm looking for is I want, the moment I see people refusing that the this, this state of mind of openness and the state of mind where they also really have to, because it's very easy to stay out of the puddle and stay dry, you know? But if, so people are refusing to get wet, I get, you know, you know? And that's the perfection I'm looking for. I know, so which I can summarize this, you know. <laughs> No, I, this is very simple. You know, you, you say, okay, this is good, it's not enough. It's great, it's not enough. Which is, you satisfied only the one thing. If you say, this is a wow, wow, when it's really. No, but it's also not, if it's, wow. if it's not if it's, good, it's, not bad. It's not about good or bad. Not it, great, it, it but wow. It has to be the only truth for that moment. But if, you, if it's already the same at the next moment, then it's in a way not the truth anymore because you can never reproduce the same thing twice. The day I will play a piece twice in the same way, I will quit. Actually, actually uh, some, somebody wrote about your art um, in the newspaper that oh my God. you were not capable of doing the same piece twice in the same way. What a compliment. Did you say that? In, yeah. Did oh, this in Dutch a, newspaper? No, no, in a German newspaper. Oh, yes. really? Yeah. And, um, oh, lovely. I didn't know that. <laughs> and I think uh, probably they meant it in a bad way, but for probably me it's, mentioned it's in a bad great way. compliment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, no, I'm not. Absolutely not. No. no. You go into, the, you go into the, on stage and something in the air is different every time. Yeah. I mean, if you do an opera series and you have eight performances, or like now we did four, you know, Every time you walk on stage, you feel right away the musicians are in a completely different state of mind. Different audience, you feel it right away. The mm. first woman, in the, so it could be a man also, row three. <coughs> <coughs> I feel it already, different atmosphere. Okay, there we are similar. If I do even just a normal speech with the public and I see somebody from the public going out, I immediately know I'm not doing great and I have to make sure that this person just go to the bathroom and come back if he didn't come back, I'm, I'm very, very upset. <laughs> I'm, it's very important that everybody's there. That everybody nobody's going to dare to move now. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. Good. Nobody was in the bathroom yet, I see it. <laughs> Today. By the way, what time are we? We're uh, nine. You see the watch? Yeah, it's nine. Ah. Four minutes past nine, actually. Um, Can we open to the public? Please? Yeah, om om almost. Safe. Almost. We, we <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, Joel said it's about risk, it's about taking risk. <laughs> and that must be uh, 
you must be thinking the same about performance, taking risk. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> There's, uh, and, but the fact is, the, 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 the important thing maybe about it is that you don't know the outcome of the live performance. That it's no, but it's not about risk so much. It's really going to the territory that you've never been mm -hmm. and also not be afraid to fail. And if you fail, it means that, that you just stand up and do it again. Yeah. And that's really, really important. That sometimes also watching the failure is for people more inspiring than to watching you succeed. Yeah. Somebody said that, that, that the success has to relate to how many failures you had in your life. Because that's every failure moves you a little farther. And that's something that we everybody afraid. And if you don't afraid of failure, that means you're repeating yourself. And you're repeating yourself is so boring. And then you, you just, you know, you, you please market and consumption of art. And it's not what we do. Not you, not me. It's making of art, it's creating of art. It's creating. Yeah. And it's creating it every time anew. You know, the, it's so interesting how the art became such a big commodity and it's yeah. is, is attached to big prices mm -hmm. and how few people actually don't care about that and really creating art because matters. You know, if you look this, like in old days, in the 70s, this beautiful little book of Patti Smith, you know, with the, her life with Marpeton, and in that time, called, the book is called Just the Kids. And the time of 70s and 80s, people was doing art because they wake up in the morning, they cannot do anything else. They have to do art. They never even think that they can sell what they're doing. They didn't think about my art market. They didn't think of any of these things because art was like a breathing. You, you could not stop creating, you know? And that's really true stuff to, that we always have to remember. Why is it important to make art? Because you you might as well just consume it. What's wrong with that? You know, it's very simple. It depends who you are. If you're an artist, you the art is like a breathing. If you're not an artist, you do something else. But <laughs> but <laughs> I, this is all I know to do. And I'm doing 50 years now, and I'm not stopping it soon. Good. Okay. Actually, we had some pictures of uh, the artists being present. Actually, we can have a look at them and um, indeed see whether there's people who um, want to participate. And I'm pretty exhausted there. <laughs> we, bring, we, bring, we bring the microphone because there are people listening at home who can't hear you if you're not talking to the microphone. And um, there might be... There's, one oh, there. there's a, woman, a woman over there of the brown. We will, yeah, we will hold it for you. But. So... Uh, I was wondering, yeah, you were saying that, um, yeah, for great art you should um, risk to fail, but I was wondering how do you know if you fail and how do you know, how do you know when it's failure and how do you know when it's not failure? If oh, you know, art. you know, you know immediately. <laughs> you, if you fail, you get sick. <laughs> you, you just get temperature. You can't breathe. You, you know, you know I, it's so interesting. I, I'm not going to tell you, but I made here in Holland one piece. It was so bad, but I didn't know yet because I never rehearse, you know, and I never actually repeat. So I, I had the public and I was doing the piece. And in the middle of the work, I knew this was real shit. I absolutely knew it in my guts, in my stomach, everywhere. And I couldn't stop. I had to go to the end. I did it to the end. And you know, it's not the public who judged me. It's myself who judged myself. I'm a witness to that. And I remember I'm, our rehearsal in Munich. Do you remember that rehearsal? Yeah. After the rehearsal, you came and looked at me and just like, this was really shit, wasn't it? And I was like, <laughs> I know, we, we, and we then, it, yeah. then you really get really not well, and physically not well. And you, you, don't, you can have any criticism in the world, but when you know that you've done your best, that you've done your this famous 150%, nobody can take this for you. You've done everything, no one critic can change you, you know? The, but you know, Marina, the one thing is, so many people fall in love with their own ideas. And I think the very few people have the courage, especially people in your, after your, your level of experience, to say, after we, we did it in Munich, after two and a half weeks of rehearsals, 10 hours every day, to say, everything we've done until now is shit, we're starting from scratch. And that means that because mo for so, many, so many people fall in love with the ideas, they fall in love with their, own, with their own tricks, you know? And to actually be so, the, the only thing you ever cared about in the entire process was the piece. And if you notice after two and a half weeks that the piece is not working, you just started from scratch, there was no vanity. But first of all, it's very important not to do things you like, because it's easy. 
and you never go anywhere, and you never change at all. But do things you're afraid of, do things that you're really, that, that, that you have fear of, the things that you've never done before. That's the interesting thing to do. And come to other side. And other side can be failure or success. This is something you don't know at all. So we, we don't know. There's incredible, interesting, the, the Gandhi, he said something that I always love to repeat. Gandhi say, you know, just about, you know, the, the, career of performance artists, in the beginning, everybody hates you. Nobody even think that, no, first they don't, they ignore you, that you don't know even this is the work. Then they hate you, then, you know, they fight you. So many different stages till you come to the position that actually you've been accepted. So the Gandhi said for himself, he said, first they ignore me, then they laugh at me, then they fight me, then I win. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Oh, 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 what, what, no, 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 one, one moment. Um, otherwise, otherwise, um, uh, uh, there, there's, there's one, somebody over here at the front row, and there might be others. Then I think uh, the Greek um, people that you run away from them was the best for you both. That's true, absolutely true, the Greek experience. It was, we, it was learn a lot, actually. Le learn us to accept situation, learn us about to be humble, learn us to really take the risk. That was true, the Greek experience, I, for me, absolutely. Come on, no you're too young, you don't have There's a gentleman over there at the back um, with a white t-shirt, I think. <laughs> probably one Greek in the audience, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm Greek. No, sorry. Um, no, I have a question. Um, how, how, do you have a feeling your ideas just come to you? Or do you start with something that you want to tell us or that you want to bring across? You want to answer first, I answer second. Is that a question or is it a request? Okay. I, I don't believe in ideas. I believe in, you get up in the morning, you sit on your desk and you do shit. I don't, I mean, this whole idea of inspiration, it's beautiful for 19th century poems. And I would love to live in a 19th century poem. But I really believe that, I mean, my daily life is incredibly banal and boring. And I just practice. And then stuff happens and it happens. And if you, you practice and practice and practice and you go on stage, forget everything you've practiced and something will happen. But I don't believe in, in sitting in an attic being inspired. I have a completely different opinion. <laughs> First of all, I hate studio. Studio is a trap. Like you're going to, like to do work in the bank or you went to factory, you go to studio and you sit there and you have to create. And then you have to create and become very kind of, the kind of mental practice. I believe in life. I think the ideas come from life. And then you go to studio and you get idea that first you're afraid of, then you go to studio to realize. But the idea can come anywhere. It can come literally in a bus station, a tram station. And I, I love the spaces what I call space in between. When you leave your, your security of the home, before you arrive somewhere else, in a transition, in, a, in a traveling between countries, wherever, when you're actually open to destiny, you open to, you, you leave your security of home and you're open to anything else, that actually channels are open. You know, if you live in one house all your life and somebody asks you to describe the door of that house, probably you will not do it. But if you're traveling to the new place, you see everything because you have fresh eyes. You have like a child, this, 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 this open, open, open senses. And this is what really is important, to put yourself in life, to put yourself in the spaces in between and to open everything. And then the ideas come like that. The ideas come like a vision. And ideas come from nowhere. I, I don't think that ideas come from yourself. And this, you have to channel. You have to be free to channel the ideas to come through you. And then again, don't take the one you like. Take the one who you don't know what it is. You're afraid of? And you're oh, especially afraid. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, hello. Uh, it's very inspiring to listen to you. Um, I want to ask you, what do you feel that are your like challenges today as an artist? Challenge to you, Marina. What? Wait, I didn't understand. Simple question. Please, again, tell me. What are your challenges now as an artist? The challenge of the artist is you have to trust yourself. 
challenge and uitdaging. And it's a it's, it, it's very difficult to be an artist. It's, it's a hell. <laughs> Not easy at all. Because, you know, first of all, and to be an artist, you have to ask, are you an artist? And to know to an artist, you have to really feel that kind of urge to create, like a breathing. You don't ask, you don't have a question, can I breathe? You just breathe. You don't have a question, you have to create, you have to create. But it doesn't make you a great artist, it just make you an artist. But to make you a great artist, you have to sacrifice a lot. You have to sacrifice so much, you know, you, 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 in, in order to actually create art that really matters. And then you also have to have talent and lots of work. You know, it's much less talent than you think that you should have. It's so much work. Work and talent together, that's it. So you see, we do agree. Hmm? Sorry? We do agree. <laughs> Not easy. Hi, Marina, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have a question about the performances. Each time when you say you perform, uh, an, in, an interaction with uh, the audience and with different uh, kinds of people and cultures and uh, generations. How do how does that affect you? How do you feel about it? And how what uh, what are the responses? And how do you how do you feel after? How does that affect you? You mean different generations working? I I I think that. For some, I'm so lucky that actually very, very young generation react on my work. When I have any kind of event, exhibitions, performances, I always see so much more younger audience than my own generation. And that means that, that I have something to connect with them. And I really love to, to work with the, with the young artists. My institute now, you know, the MAI, is, is, is a Brahmach Institute really specialized for young artists that we also made this no intermission here in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Kare Theater and we are doing all over the world. And one thing that we really introduce in this institute and working with young artists, it's long durational performance art. Because in my career, through the, all these years, I understand that actually one of the most difficult form of art is long durational. Because long durational, if something is more than three, four, five, seven, eight hours, 12 hours, one month, two months, three months, eight hours a day, is you can't pretend, you can't play anything else. You become true self. And this is so difficult and so vulnerable. And that way you really mentally, physically change and the public change with you. And public looking at you, supporting you, actually create new community around art. And that's something that is kind of happening right now with, with our institute, which is so incredible for me to see and to nourish. So, you know, I just tell you one, one, one simple example of this long duration. There was, in, you know, we, 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 well, how are we going? How are we doing? We go to the different countries. Can be Turkey, can be the, 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 the Ukraine, can be Brazil, can be Brazil, and then we make open call for the artists who like to do long durational work. Even if you've never done long durational work, you can send idea. And then we choose ideas that we think they're good. And then we train them in, you know, with the call in the, the cleaning house workshop where you go five days, no food, no talking, doing physical, mental exercises to be able physically to do this. And then we had in Benaki Museum one Greek girl who came and she, Greek again, but this was a great piece. So, so she came and she said in her performance, which I like to do, the, the museum is, is we, get, we got museum for two months, eight hours a day. Two months, eight hours a day. We take eight hours because museum is open from six to, to 10 to six, so we take the museum, you know, the time, normal, regular time, but for long duration of work. So she wants to count the seconds. And I, I know so much about long duration. I think this was mission impossible. How to count seconds, eight hours a day, for two months, this is kind of insanity. And, and then she said, no, let's try. And she started doing this. And then the people come, the audience, and listening, and they could not believe they can bring friends, and the friends bring friends. And the last months of her performance, entire audience is coming continuously and counting seconds with her. This was something that 
I could not even explain to emotions of that. Seconds become something to do with the universe, with the time, with the temporality, with life, with death, with everything you can imagine. That seconds transmit into something completely transcendent, into something much bigger than just counting seconds. And this performance changed her, changed the audience, changed everything. So this is for us so important, introduction of long durational work. This is what I think the, the performance art should go now. Yes, when you're describing your long durational work, it almost sound, sounds to me like it's some kind of meditative state you're coming in. And I'm wondering, like, how do you look at it's a, a relationship between art and religion? Uh, how do they compare or where do they overlap? I, uh, I really don't like religion because it's institution and it's based on power and money, but I like spirituality. That's totally different thing. Spirituality is something, and I think every, every great work of art has a spiritual aspect in it. There's absolutely no question. And uh, to me, you know, the, 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 the long duration of work is also very much connected to repetition. And repetition, if you think on ancient cultures, all the old rituals from the Tibetan, Zen Buddhism, the Theravada monks, uh, uh, the aborigines, the shamans from Brazil, they're, they're actually based on repetition of the same rituals, the same way, same time, which create a very meditative state of mind. And that actually opens your consciousness to another state. And that's really important. And this performance really have that kind of key to do that. You, you said in your um, walk through walls, um, the shaman, Denise Meyer, there were two shaman who uh, helped you uh, with things from your youth, and you said, one of them said to you, uh, your purpose is to help humans to transcend pain. <laughs> that was his opinion. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I went to the to Brazil, and there was this really woman, very powerful shaman, who actually, you know, worked very much with nature. Yeah. And she had these shells and kind of throw it on the, on the, in, the, in the dirt. And she looked at me and she said, oh, you don't come from this planet. You are from another galactic, the galactic uh, area. And, and your, uh, your galactic nature came to this planet with a purpose. I s and that gets so interesting. I love this kind of stuff. I say, <laughs> what is my, what, where they come from? Why? And she said, because you, your purpose is here on this planet to learn the humans to transcend and pain. I was very happy with this answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how true it is. It's just, just you know, you need, you need literature, you need poetry, you need so many things. Does it really matter if it's true or not? Huh? Does it matter if it's true or not? I'm still dealing with pain. <laughs> yeah, it's true. OK. You all have to be asked for at least three questions because I talk too much. Oh, no, I think everyone wants to ask you questions. I talk too much anyway. <laughs> hey, um, I, I just want to ask a very good question because... Mar <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, thanks to documentations, Marina. Um, I'm coming from Turkey. I never had a chance to see your work in real life. Um, but thanks to documentation, I know your work for a long time. Um, I'm going to ask a very simple question because when I look at your art, I see you alone or lonely, not in a dramatic way. So I would like to ask, like, how do you handle loneliness after you perform? This is a wonderful question. Wow. <laughs> so. You know, when you do something really intense, like I, I just take, a, let's say, example of Artist's Presence. This was one incredibly demanding performance for me. Every single day, it was so painful, so difficult. I was thinking, can I, can I continue? Can it be next day, next day, till I really finish? And finally, I finished 716 hours. It took three months. And I remember stand up from this chair, I felt that I'm changed, I'm different, something really happened. I went home alone, took a long, long bath, and I could not sleep, I could, it was like, I was in a, some kind of very 
you know, it's not really loneliness. It's more solitude. Loneliness is something sad, you know, because you kind of feel alone. But solitude is something that is wonderful feeling of being kind of with yourself, but really truly with yourself. The one thing when I've done any kind of different performances or opera, or whatever, I don't like to see people and to talk about work. What all of what I like is ice cream. <laughs> There's a young lady over there at the red. Um, um, jumper, I think it is. Hello, um, my name is Charlotte. I Now I feel a little bit silly because my question was quite similar, but then more before you create your art, how you deal with alone time, because if you work a lot with the collaborations, but then also, I know I find it difficult sometimes to find a good balance by Okay, do I need to be alone to work? But also, you need it with people. So I was wondering, what do you guys do for that? You know, the, I work alone first, and then worked with collaboration with Ulay, which was 12 years, and finished the Great Wall of China. And after that collaboration, I will say to myself, never collaborate with anybody else. This was it. I, I could not deal with this again. And because, first of all, when we worked together, I really felt it was actually higher than just working alone. Because we have a two egos to put together and melt it into something which I call, you know, we call actually together that self, the kind of third energy, which is not him, not me, but actually work together. And it was actually very strong. And, and, and in a way, reaches than just your own work. But then when our relation was collapsing, I was ashamed to actually admit failure. And I could not say for three years to my friends or to anybody that actually we failed. We could not communicate and we could not continue working together. And when this failed, I continue really just very strongly to do my own work. And then I start being open with collaboration. Opera is a big collaboration. I collaborate also with Labri Cekrvi, Damien Jalet, in creating new bolero for French opera. I also collaborate with them to creating the, the, the Pelias and Melisandre, you know, another opera. I collaborate with Igor uh, Levitt, the, 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 the pianist, to create something called, you know, the, the, the new way to solicit the classic music. So I was open for, you know, short collaborations here and there, but basically continue work on myself. It's not easy, you know, to have longer collaborations. I don't actually believe them anymore. I, I really had one. It was enough for this lifetime. You always collaborate with the whole with the whole orchestra. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 do, I, do, I cannot work alone because my entire work depends on other people producing sound. So it's a, it's a, it's a very ambivalent state to be in because you have to trust 80 people that you've never met before, um, and if you don't, it won't work. There is, it's like it's almost it's a, it's collaboration by force, but it's beautiful, um, and it's it's difficult because sometimes I mean it's like with humans. Sometimes the chemistry is great. Sometimes the chemistry just isn't, and you can try, and you can control people and try to uh, inspire them, and you can also try to uh, see why, what is working, what is not, but sometimes it just doesn't, like it does, doesn't with people. And I think that, you know, as a conductor, you, you go into this job assuming that you will, that you're basically completely and utterly useless without people. And that's, I mean, a uh, conducting stick does not produce sound, and it's something that you know when you get into the job. And I find, you know, it was interesting, last time we were here, it was actually Milo Rao who said, uh, I don't think, I cannot think alone, I can only think with others. And I think there are different ways that, and, and it's interesting, for example, I, for me, like you said, you go into life, daily life is like, a, is like a kaleidoscope of impressions and of experiences that I take all in, and then it goes into this like big, uh, let's say big cauldron, and then it all comes out in the right moment in the right way, but I, don't, I could not sit with eight people or something and think together. I don't know how he does it. For example, it's, it's really like, it's some, and I never know where the input, or where, let's say when the output comes, which input it comes from. It's like it's this big, it's a big, 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 uh, yeah, cauldron is the best word to say that you throw it all in, it's the things that you experience, the people you meet, the things you eat, the things you smell, everything goes into this one big box, and then at some point it comes in the right moment in the right way. And, the biggest challenge is when you sit, stand in front of 80 people, is to know that, yes, you have an idea, but you also have to let go and accept that they also have an idea, and how do you find a way that it all goes together and realize that you will always, your idea will always be better 
if it's joining their ideas rather than just, and that's, it, that takes a lot, of, a lot of trust, and I think it's, uh, I'm, I, I think it's a lifelong right. journey, to be honest. I have to go to the bathroom and come back. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I was boring now because you're going to the bathroom? <laughs> maybe it's me. Maybe it's maybe you'll we'll never maybe come back. No? Maybe maybe it's the audience. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. So should we talk about something else? Um, yeah, I was wondering: um, Would you be convinced by Marina that um, because he said you, know, you have to compromise, you have to sometimes you know record, um, you have to be realistic? Um, would you? Not start I think recording two things. For example, what the gentleman from Turkey said, I comp I'm so delighted that you were able to see these documentations because I know also for myself that my greatest uh, inspiration as musicians, they're all dead. So I would never be exposed to them if there was no documentation. So I'm happy for you that you saw her work just as much as I grew up on Kalas and on Futwängler, on, on listening to on Lona Bernstein, who inspired me probably more than any other conductor. And I, that would, I would never have access to that if there was no documentation. But I still think that it's important to differentiate, is it the artwork or is it a documentation of the artwork? That's, and, th and there I don't believe in a compromise because I still think that I should, one should always be aware, and I'm sure you also know that, or everyone that has seen that, that seeing it live would still be a completely different experience, yet I am happy and think it's right that it's possible to, to see it also for someone who's not there. I missed this part, I'm sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> it was a very important part, but... <laughs> that's, um, we still have, um, a, we still have a, a little video to look at, impom, Imponderabilia, we'll watch it together. Um, I'm just drawing to a close. It has been a long, long, long weeks for you. And you, you've performed how many operas in the past? For 80, for, for 48 hours? Four? Um, so thank you very, very much both for um, after that exhausting marathon uh, to be here and talk to the public and be at the Bali. Thank you very much both. And we have a video of uh, Imponderabilia with Let's have a look at it. And then there's the bar, and then there's the next time, um, maybe with UL, because we continue our um, conversations. And thank it's, you very much. Yeah, but it's all story about Imponderabilia. We just can't show them and then leave them without story. OK, we listen to your story after it. OK. <laughs> thank you. Let's make it short. <laughs> I can tell a story because there's no sound. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> this is a this is the Biennale in actually performance event in Bologna in 1977, and uh, it was one of the big performances in those days. Uh, many people came: Vito Conchi, Gina Pane, Lori Anderson, and Ula and me was invited. So we came with the car, which we lived for five years, with no money of any kind, with last liter of gasoline, knowing they're going to pay us something like, uh, I think in those days, in, let's say in, now is euro, what would be maybe, I don't know, 300 euro, and, um, which was a huge amount of money for us. We could you know, live for a while. And then we decided to make this piece that we rebuilt the main entrance of the museum smaller and create this entrance so they actually create the door of the museum. It's a very poetical idea, the artist as a, as a door of the museum. If there are no artists, there will not be museums, so we was a door. And we asked public to actually go through and uh, they have to choose one side or my side to turn because they could not go frontally. And only when they come to the first floor of the gallery, they could see our choice, their own choices. So we have the idea to, stay, to there be around six hours. And after three hours, they came the police. And they all first <laughs> cross between the door facing me and then ask us for our passports, which we didn't have. And then they forbid the performance. So, so this was the end. So now, the more interesting story about this piece became legendary and kind of very important. But the idea that what happened actually background is incredible. We was there for one week with, with other 12 artists building the whole show. And we all supposed to get this 300, 300 euro and nobody was paying us anything. They, they take us always to some good dinners, but nobody was paying us. And two of us, if we didn't have this money, we could not even get the gasoline to move away. 
So for us, it was essential to be paid. But every day, Italians would say, oh, this is a strike. Or yesterday, the, the cousin forgot the key from the, from the, from the safe. Or, or somebody was pregnant, or some emergency. It was always an excuse. But we knew the moment, if we do the performance, and they would never pay us, they would say the, the bank, you know, the check is in the mail, or something like that. So then, just like half an hour before performance, we both naked, waiting to start. All I naked, totally naked, Take the, went to the third floor of the office of the museum and opened the door and the lone secretary was sitting there. And he looked at her and said, we want our money. She was so shocked. She had the key right away inside, the, of course, inside the door. Take the key, open the door, and give this 300 euros. So now, 300 euros, the, in that time, there was a paper money Italian. This was such a big money amount. It was all in paper, huge block. So he didn't know what to do with this. Now he's naked with his money. So he looked so look in the rubbish, rubbish bag, and he finds some... The, the, the plastic, and he put, type everything in plastic and with the, with the little <coughs> rubber. So what to do with this? So he ran to the, and the he already performance going to start. So he ran into the the main toilet and they put in the in the top, you know, in the, in the water to float. So now I have no idea about all this, and we are now start performance, and I see incredible worry in his face all the time. And I was thinking he was worried about performance, but he was worried about money to be flushed. And, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then on the end, you know, we was only one paid in this piece. So this piece has so much memory. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.